talk about the hidden treasures of darkness. Yep. Then, oh, I'm, thank you. Well, John saved me this time from forgetting the offering. If you got Wednesday night offering, I'm just going to come around and pick that up for you. And again, thank you all for being here tonight. Talking about the hidden treasures of darkness. Uh, or, if you want to give it a secondary title, uh, what's going on when God goes silent? What's happening in my life when the voice of God falls silent in my life? And we're so uh, hopeful, but uh, I don't know if we'll get through all of this tonight. I've only got four pages of scriptures and about 12 pages of notes. So we'll see how much we get through. Sister Chrissy's already shaking her head now. That's never going to happen. So we'll see how much we get through tonight. But as we're getting started, we've talked a whole lot about the voice of God. My mother just said she's going to be talking about the voice of God at the next intercessory prayer meeting uh, that they're going to do on Monday. What are, we what are we talking about when we're talking about the voice of God? When I sat up here in my preacher garb, using my best preacher language, uh, talking through, you know, using church speak, and I'm talking about the face of God, the voice of God, the hand of God, the heart of God, what are we talking about? Am I literally talking about a hand? Am I literally talking about a voice? Am I literally talking about a face? And in some biblical cases, yes, but I want to put this out there to you. Most of the time when I'm talking about face, voice, hand, heart, different things like that in, in relationship to the Father, what I'm talking about is a manifestation of the Holy Ghost in you, on you, or through you. Yeah. If I talk about you seeing the face of God, I'm talking about a manifestation of the presence of God by the Holy Ghost on you. I'm talking about hearing the voice of God. I'm talking about hearing a manifest hearing through the Holy Ghost within me. Okay? All of these are revelations of his glory. But I need to remind you as we are starting tonight, if you are saved and you are filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost dwells inside of you. And so when you start talking about the voice of God, the face of God, the heart of God, the hand of God, all of these things, what I'm talking about is the indwelled presence of God that is in you becoming a revealed presence on you. Good. Yes. Amen. You see, we get the idea that the presence of God, the voice of God, all of those other things, we talk about those, the voice of God waxes and wanes, the presence of God waxes and wanes, the... the, the, uh, the uh, Heart of God, the my, my uh, understanding of the heart of God, of heart of God, or my experience of the heart of God's waxing and waning, coming and going. But I want to remind you that's just the revelation of it, or the revealed part of it. The indwelled presence of God in you does not wax or wane. That's correct. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you are filled with the presence of God within you, always, at all times. The infilling of the Holy Ghost in you, if you are filled, does not wax and wane. Right, right. You are indwelled by the presence of God within you. You're hearing the voice of God, now I'm having a manifestation of that Spirit of God that's indwelled in me is now being revealed to me, manifesting to me. If I say I see his face, hear his voice, vision, whatever, I'm talking about the indwelled Holy Ghost in you becoming revealed to you. Amen. Now, I want to make that point very clear before I start talking about this tonight. Because, you know, I'm going to talk about the hidden treasures of darkness. What happens when the voice of God goes silent? But the first thing you need to understand about what happens when the voice of God goes silent is God did not leave you. Amen. Amen. If you're not having a manifestation of his voice, of his face, of his heart, of his hand, of his foot, whatever, it does not change the fact that you're filled with the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God dwells in you. All that's happened is the revelation, the external revelation of that manifestation has ceased, but the indwelling is always still there. It's extremely important that I embrace the fact that once I become filled with the Holy Ghost and He dwells in me, He does not wax or wane in and out of me. Right. He's there when I see Him. He's there when I don't see Him. He's there when I hear Him. He's there if I don't hear Him. He's there when I'm experiencing Him. He's there when I'm not experiencing Him. He's always with me. It's just the revelation of it that changes, the manifestation of it that changes. So 
please make that solid within you that God does the infilling and the indwelled presence of God, the Holy Ghost, the indwelled presence of God in you, does not wax or wane in you. Your consciousness of it may, but his presence is not. It's solid. Now, last week I asked how many people have ever gone through times when it seems as if God stopped talking. Let's try that again. How many of you in this room can say by a raised hand, I've gone through periods of time in my life where it seemed like God stopped talking? Well, if you didn't raise your hand, uh, it's probably because you hadn't been in the way very long. Because we all go through these places in our life. And it's not, maybe it's that we're not hearing Maybe it is that he's not talking. We're going to talk about what is it. Now listen to this. If you are not in sin, this is what I'm talking about. If, you're, if God has stopped talking, not in sin, but suddenly, all of a sudden, you're not walking in intentional sin. You're not walking in, uh, in free will sin on purpose. Because if you're walking in intentional sin by your desire and your free will, the voice of the Father will go far from you. Okay? That's, that's the effect of sin. But I'm not talking about people that are living in sin. I'm talking to saints tonight. Yes. Saints who are doing everything they know how to do to do it right. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you're not in sin, but suddenly there's no feeling, no voice, no direction, etc. Mm -hmm. You find yourself needing a direction and there's no direction. You find yourself needing a voice and there's no voice. You find yourself needing a feeling and there's no feeling. Yeah. You show up at church and everybody else in the house shouts and you go back to the old country saying you dry as shucks. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? You're sitting in a church service and there's 80 people there and 79 of them shouting. And you're number 80. And it ever seems like everybody else is under the glory spout, but you're not. What's going on? Is it, and I'm going to term this a spiritual winter. Where you're going through a time like it's a spiritual winter in your life. Our initial reaction, and it's not necessarily a wrong reaction, but when we enter into a spiritual winter, most of the time our initial reaction going into that spiritual winter is, I begin to ask myself, have I sinned? I begin to immediately judge myself. Because it's our first go-to. If I am, if the voice of God is not speaking to me, I must have done something wrong. Right. I turned left, he turned right. I went straight, he went back. I did this, I did that. I must have made him angry so he's, he stopped talking to me. And that's our initial reaction. And if I judge myself, ask myself, have I sinned? And if I do that and my answer is no, I'm going to talk to you about that. Now, if I'm not real careful, here's what will happen. I will first judge myself, and even if I say, nope, I haven't sinned, I will immediately begin to fall into condemnation, and then I will go into spiritual depression. Yeah. I'll go and throw my spiritual pout on, and I'll start feeling <laughs> cast down, left out, rejected, and abandoned. Yeah. I, I, it's okay, I can say it because I've done it. So yeah. we'll, get to, we'll get that, we'll get under condemnation. Which drives us away from the cross. Really, God's rejected me. God's abandoned me. He's not talking to me. He must be angry. He's abandoned me. He's left me here all by myself. I'm going through this hard place, hard time, hard decision. And he's left me all along. So therefore, I'm abandoned and I'm rejected. And I'm cast away. And I get into condemnation and guilt. And I feel like I'm abandoned. And I start pouting. I want to remind you. Romans chapter 8. Verse 14, 15, and 16. Let's look at that. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, 15, and 16. This scripture says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you and Now, that sons is a generic term. That just means a child. Okay? So here it says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, listen to me. The Spirit of God is leading you. Yes, is. Period. He's always leading, always guiding, always directing, always teaching. Those are his job descriptions. Leading, guiding, teaching, directing, and maturing. Yes, that's right. Hear that one? 
Leading, guiding, directing, teaching, and maturing. You see, I am a child of God. He is my Abba Father. I am his son. And because of that, I must always know he dwells in me and he is leading me even if I don't hear him. I must have the faith to believe that I am indwelled by him. I am not in sin. I cast that condemnation away. And I say, even if I can't hear him, he is leading me. And I have faith in that leading. Conviction is the voice of the grieved Holy Ghost in me that drives me to the cross. Now hear that. If, I, if the Spirit of God is convicting me, that is the voice of the Holy Ghost grieved inside of me, and he will, he will bring me to a place of repentance. Condemnation is the one that loads guilt on you. Condemnation is judgment without mercy. Right. You're continually judging yourself, but you're not being merciful to yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not allowing yourself mercy. That's condemnation. Conviction is the voice of the grieved Holy Ghost inside of me that brings me to the cross. But as soon as I repent, conviction lifts. Mm -hmm. Condemnation hangs around a while. That's right. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. If it's true conviction, the instant I repent, conviction is done. It's fulfilled its job description, and it will no longer weight me down, burden me, put fear on me, or depression or anxiety. Right. Those are the, uh, the works of condemnation. Yes. So as soon as I repent, conviction lifts. Whatever's left behind after that is condemnation. Amen. Okay? If the silence, now hear this. If the silence of God does not contain conviction, then it is not disciplinarian. If the silence of God does not contain conviction, conviction is the voice of the grieved Holy Ghost driving me to the cross. All of a sudden, I'm not hearing the voice of the Father. I go to prayer. I'm on my face before God. Something is revealed inside of me that I'm harboring maybe an unforgiveness against my brother. I repent. I go on. That's done. But all of a sudden, maybe the voice of God goes silent. I get down in prayer. I'm praying, Father, have I done something? I'm doing the self-judgment and nothing comes. I'm not convicted. I'm not in sin. Sure. Yeah. Now, listen to me. The silence of God, that is not a voice of conviction, If that, then it is not God disciplining me by ignoring me. Sure. Yeah. Your brother would get mad at you and stop talking to you. Mm -hmm. Your sister would get mad at you and stop talking to you. Friends, people at school, neighbors, mother, dad, etc. Those people might get mad at you and stop talking to you. But the silence of God is not disciplinary. It's instructional. Some of you have, there's been times in your life that God stopped talking. You felt like you, like I was talking about before. There was no feeling, no emotion, on and on and on. And the next thing you realize, you feel like you think that you're being disciplined by God by Him removing His presence from you. But if it's the if the Father is going to discipline you, He's going to discipline you through the Word of the Lord and through the conviction of the Holy Ghost. If you've repented and there is no sin, that silence is not discipline. It's instruction. We need to be able to find that if it's instruction, what am I being instructed in? Now, if I am in long-term intentional sin, let me remind you again, that can cause the silence. That would, and therein, though, that would lead to conviction. Okay? But if that's not the case, silence is not disciplinary. If it's instructional, hear this. If it's instructional, it is for my maturity. If the Father, if, if there's silence, if, the, if there's no feeling, etc., that is a growing me into maturity. And I'm going to give you scriptures for all this and show you where I got all this from. It is, it is instructional and it is for my growing up. I'm going to answer the question, how and what do I learn in it? If you're in a time of difficulty, now listen to this, if you're going through a time of struggle, a time of difficulty in your life, a time of spiritual silence, your flesh will try to fill the void of the voice of God uh, with condemnation. And you're going to have to be very careful not to get in condemnation because condemnation will destroy your maturity in Christ. Yeah. And you'll lose the instructional part of the silence. So God, if there's condemnation, remember, there's now therefore no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Yeah. 
So get out of that condemnation. Push it aside. When the thoughts of it come, say, no, in the name of Jesus, my, my sins are under the blood. I am not in condemnation and guilt. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, 1 John, let's talk about what am I going to learn out of this. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. How many of you knew this scripture? God is light. Yeah. Now, 1 John, God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. But, so I want to tell you this. This means that God is always righteous and holy and there's no evil in him ever. Right. Yeah. Ever. That's right. He has no evil in him. He doesn't convict a man or can, he doesn't tempt a man to do evil ever. There's no darkness in him. There is no evil in him. He is only a God of light. But, hear this, he does at times hide himself in darkness. The God of light does at times hide himself in darkness. I want to prove all this to you with the scripture, but I'll just throw this one out there for you uh, just to get you started. What was one of the first things God said in the creation of the earth? Let there, be light. Let there be light. If God was light, why did he have to call light? Hmm. Interesting. So you, that's proof to you that God sometimes hides in thick darkness. He does not hide in evil or darkness as a covering, but he just does sometimes hide himself for a reason, and it's for our maturity. Exodus chapter 20, verse 21, and the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Where was God at that moment? He was in the, in the darkness. Was he plainly visible to everybody else on the plane? No. Who's the only person that found him in that group? Moses. Where did Moses find him? In the darkness. And Moses had to go in that darkness to find him. Right? Now, was it God? Absolutely. Was he there? Absolutely. Was he available to them? Absolutely. Was his presence with them? Absolutely. Was he visible to all of those people? No. He was not. And so to them, they would say, God is hiding from us. Why was he hiding? Again, I want to tell you, it's for, <laughs> it's for our maturity. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 3. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness. <clears throat> Look at this scripture. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hide in the hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest knowest that I, the Lord, which called thee by name, am the God of Israel. Look at this. I will give you the treasures of what? Darkness. darkness. Question. Where are the treasures of darkness found? In the darkness. You cannot find the treasures of darkness unless you find it in the darkness. Where are the treasures of the secret place found? In the secret place. And so that tells me that there are secret things hidden in God. And at times there are great treasures in the thick darkness that God hides himself in. And if I am continually rejecting the darkness, rejecting the times when his face is hidden, and hiding myself from those things, and I refuse to enter in the darkness to find the treasure, will I ever have the treasure of darkness? No, you cannot stand in light and have the treasure of darkness. I'm just letting you think about that. You cannot stand in the light and have the hidden treasures of the darkness. You cannot stand in a wide place and have the treasure of the hidden place. You can't do it. The only way you can have the treasures of the darkness is be in the darkness. The only way you can find the treasure of the hidden place, those things hidden in the hidden place, is be in the hidden place. Now, I want to ask you this question. How often do we as saints put our spiritual pout on and get mad when God calls us into the darkness and instead of entering in to the darkness and saying, give me the treasures that are in here, we pout and say, no, I want the popcorn on the ground in the light. 
Because, say, I keep telling you that the purpose of the darkness and the hidden place is for my spiritual maturity. It's where I'm going to grow. It's where I'm going to become mature. Proverbs, I'm going to tell you what are the treasures of riches and of darkness and the, the treasures of the secret place. I'm going to give you a couple of them. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. With all you're getting, get understanding. These are the treasures of darkness. When he says in Isaiah, I will give you the treasures of darkness. What are the treasures of darkness? Number one, understanding. Number two, wisdom. Wisdom and understanding are treasures of darkness. Another one, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Another treasure of darkness is growth. Spiritual growth. Summer. Well, I, mean, I, I didn't know if I was going to ride on the board tonight or not, but I'll do it. If I say summer, fall, winter, spring. Summer, fall, winter, spring. If I never go through a winter season, mm -hmm. I'll use a tulip for example. If you don't freeze a tulip bulb, did you know the next year it will just keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter? It'll come to a place that don't even bloom. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's got to be planted deep to have a long stem, and it's got to freeze for a certain period of time, else it will not grow a long stem and it will not bloom. Why? It has to go through a winter season so that in the spring it can grow and in the summer it can bear fruit so that in the fall it can have harvest. And so many times we as saints as we're entering into a spiritual winter, which is going to include me growing in wisdom, growing in understanding, and it's going to it spur my growth, we begin to enter into the winter season and we begin to fight it and claw and cry and weep and try to climb back up to last year's summer. Subverting our own maturity, our own growth in wisdom, and our own growth in knowledge. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Yeah. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Mm -hmm. Another one of the riches in the darkness. One is wisdom. One is knowledge. One is spiritual growth. The next one is the exercise of discernment that brings me to full age. Yep. Yeah. You will exercise certain things in moments of darkness that you cannot exercise in moments of light. I'm going to give you an example. There was a certain kind of faith that the disciples could exercise when Jesus was awake with them in a boat and the water was calm. There was a whole other kind of faith that they were exercising when Jesus was asleep in the boat in the bottom and it was stormy. A whole different kind of faith. They run down to the bottom of the boat, wake Jesus up, and he looks at them and says, how is it that you have no faith? It wasn't that they didn't have sunshine, calm sea faith. They were full of sunshine, calm sea faith. They were full of that kind of faith, but they didn't have sleep, bottom boat, storm kind of faith. A different kind of faith. And so there, in that place, I find a maturing as I learn how to discern good and evil in a place of maturity. But I only get that in that place as a hidden treasure of darkness. It's a place where I'm going through a, a struggle. I'm not feeling it like I used to. I'm not hearing it like I used to, and so on. The treasure of darkness... And this experience of, is, is the experience of passing through it. You know what I just said? The treasure, the number one treasure of darkness is the experience of having survived it. It's so the number one, because that's where I'm growing. I'm maturing. How many of you, and we'll do this by show of hands, have ever gone through something that when you in, went into it, you were here, and when you came out, to, out of it spiritually, you were here? Oh, yeah. But the process from here to here was not so good. Well, how did you grow? You're telling me that you went through a hard place that was struggle and tough. 
But yet when you came out of it, you were better than when you started. What did you just tell me? I went through a spiritual winter. I had come through a time of fruiting, a summer. I had harvested. But now the fields were bare and it was time to enter into a winter season. And I went into a winter season. But when I came out in the spring, the seed that had been planted the year before, all of a sudden began to come up through the soil. And there was a summer and another crop was produced. How did that happen? It only happened because you went through a, a winter, a spiritual winter. And so the number one treasure of darkness is having passed through it because as I pass through, I grow, I mature, I increase in faith, I increase in patience, I increase in perseverance, I increase in learning how to pay the price. Yeah. You see, as saints, especially modern day saints, we don't like anybody to preach on patience and perseverance. <laughs> yeah. There are words in the church that we just don't like anymore. Patient, perseverance, and persistence. We don't want to persist. We don't want to pers persevere. We don't want to have to do those things. But I want to tell you, the number one treasure of darkness is just the fact that you survive standing up, chasing your king. You came through it and you grew in it. It's a treasure of darkness. You can't get any other way. You know, the absolute best way, for all you guys that play football, you know this is true. The absolute best way to be successful on Friday nights is to have worked your tail off in two a days through the summer. Got out there, bore the heat, the sweat, the pain, the blood, out there just pouring it out. And then all of a sudden you're successful on Friday night. How did you get there? I, I endured the summer. I endured through that through that pouring out of that, that out, I grew. Now, <laughs> look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 45. Matthew chapter 13, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking godly per uh, goodly pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Notice this, it was a pearl of great price. And notice something else. This is a representation of the kingdom of God. The pearl of great price was not laying on top of a table somewhere where the man could easily stumble across it and treat it vainly. Notice what it says. Kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking godly pearls. When he found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all he had and bought it. This thing was expensive. It was hard to find. He had to seek hard for it. And then when he found it, he had to become destitute to become greatly rich. Sold everything he had. He became destitute before he could become rich. And why would God hide things from his children? Why would he hide this good stuff from his children? And here's the reason. Because it is a pearl of great price. And if you leave something of great price out where anybody and everybody can find it, nobody will value it. If God left all of his treasure exposed where sinners and saints alike could find it, where anybody with any amount of effort could get it, it would have absolutely no value. Think about what are the things that people do with the free advertiser newspaper. newspaper. You, go to the, you go to these restaurants, they got the little free advertiser sitting out there. How many people even pick one up? It's free. And the newspaper guy rolls them up and throws them in your driveway whether you order them or not. What do people do with them? They run over them. Drive them. Drive over them. Use them to line the bird cage. Why? It's totally free. It has value. It's got good stuff in it. Why are you just running over it? Because it was free. Because you didn't pay anything for it. If that dude was a hundred bucks, guess what you'd do with it? You'd take it in the house and read every word of it. Twice. That's, and I know that's kind of an off example. But that's what we do when things are too easy. When things are too easy, they have no value. Why do, you, why do we have to pay the price? I know they have to pay the teachers. But you know one of the reasons why college education is so expensive? Because it's what it's worth in the end. Because it has great value. If it was totally free, if free 
college education really does come to the United States of America, the number of people getting it will plummet. And its value will decline. Why? Because it has no value. You don't, it doesn't cost you anything to get it. Anybody and everybody can get it, and it will mean nothing. Because its value will decrease. The more we pay for something, the better we will treat it. I got y'all quiet and thinking hard. The more we pay for something, the more value it has in our life. And the Father has hidden the hidden treasures of darkness. He didn't hide them so that we would not find them. He hid them so they would have great value. <coughs> so that, and it is perfectly achievable to be found by all of his sons and all of his daughters if they will sell all they have and buy the pearl. But sometimes buying the pearl is going through the spiritual winter. So what is this darkness that he hides in? Yep, you sure can. The rich young ruler found the pearl and took it back. Yes, he did. Say that again. The rich young ruler found the pearl and refused to buy it. Because he would not go through a spiritual winter. He wouldn't sell all he had. He said, nope, no thank you, price is too high. I'm not going to have that. So what is this darkness that the Father hides in? And I'm going to just throw this out there quickly. Oftentimes the darkness that he hides in is struggle, affliction, persecution, spiritual famine, and silence. I cannot tell you how many times as a pastor I run into people and they're going through a struggle in their life. And they say this word to me. I, it's too hard. I'm not going to do this anymore. I quit. I quit. You know what they just said to me? I'm in a spiritual winter and it's a struggle and I don't like the winter anymore. I'm done with this. The price of the pearl is too great. I'm not going to make it through. I hear that over and over and over and over and over and over. It's too hard. I can't do this. I'm not doing this anymore. I quit. I literally hear people say, I quit. My answer always is quit to what? What are you going to quit to? My favorite thing to do to them is when they say, I quit, say, oh, so you're going to go out, you're going to go buy a case of beer, you're going to get roaring drunk tonight, and then three days from now, you're going to die and go straight to hell. And I always go, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. What, what are you quitting to? Yeah, right. I mean, there's just life and death. Yeah. Mm -hmm, true. Yeah. If you're walking in life and you quit, there's only one option, yeah. death. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to quit to? So there's no place for us to quit. And I know it's a struggle. And I know there's affliction. I know there's persecution. I know there's a place of spiritual famine. I know there's a place of silence when the Father is hiding in silence. But listen to me. All of that is for your maturity, your growth. He's not punishing you. It's not disciplinary. And as a matter of fact, it's instructional. It's our place of growth. Amos chapter 5 verse 4. Somebody better tell me what time it is because the clock's got a glare on it. Woo. Okay. Amos chapter 5 verse 4. This scripture says, For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me and you shall live. When you feel like the glory has lifted, when you feel like the voice of God has gone silent, when you feel like you're in a spiritual struggle all alone, when you feel like you're in persecution or affliction, hear me, I'm going to give you the answer on how to make it through a spiritual winter, and the answer is push harder. If you're going to grow, if you're going to mature, if you're going to survive to the other side, if God has stopped speaking, if his voice has gone silent, you know what the answer is? Not to pout and get mad and stomp your foot. The answer is to chase harder, seek harder, find harder, knock harder, push harder, 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 harder. How I pursue in the winter dictates my crop in the summer. Nathan. So you're saying the harder it is, the better the ending's going to be? Yes, sir. As long as you keep fighting. As long as you keep fighting and do not quit. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to Job here in a little bit, and we'll talk about how that worked out for Job. The answer is, 
no matter what you're going through, if you can say, I haven't heard his voice in a while, I haven't felt him in a while, the answer is push harder, seek harder, chase harder. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 11, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives, everyone that seeks finds, mm -hmm. to him that knocks it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you who when his son asks of bread will give him a stone, asks for a fish will give him a serpent. If you have been evil, know how to give a good gift to your kids, how much more does God, who is perfect and wonderful and loving, know how to give to you? But notice this. It requires asking. And it requires seeking. And it requires knocking. Asking means there's something you don't have. Seeking means there's something you can't see. Knocking means there's something on the other side of a door. All of those things mean they are hidden. Asking for something that I do not have. Seeking for something I do not hold. Knocking for something I don't have in my hand. That, all of that stuff is stuff that is hidden. Listen to me. Pursuit in moments of darkness is utterly, absolutely, wonderfully important. You must push. You must ask. You must seek. You must knock. And you might say, I've been asking, seeking, knocking. And I'm going to say, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. I've been doing it six months. Do it six years if you have yes. to. Because the answer is, pursuit is the purpose. It's instructional. The silence I'm going through, the struggle I'm going through is instructional. How do I grow thereby? How do I mature thereby? How do I discern good for evil in this? Lord, teach me, lead me in this, and I will not quit chasing you till I come out the other side. A determination of pursuit in moments of darkness. Treasures of darkness are only found in darkness. So if you are in darkness, practice this. The word says, in all things give thanks. Yeah. And if you can't do anything else but thank God for the darkness, then thank God for the darkness. Thank you that I stand in a dry place. Thank you that I stand in affliction. Thank you that I stand in struggle. Thank you that I stand in a moment of silence because I know there are treasures hidden in this place and I'm going to pursue you even if it's dark, even if it's hard, even if it's a struggle. I'm not going to quit. Thank you for the darkness because I know in this darkness there is great treasure and I'm going to grow here whatever it takes, however long it is. I'm not going to be moved. I'm going to pursue you and I'm going to grow. A determination that I will not quit. Your growth and maturity depend on how you act in moments of darkness. Brother, the Bible says our light affliction is for but a moment. Yes. And it works a far more eternal, exceeding way of glory. Right. We stop and think about that. What's it, what is it, that eternal, exceeding eternal way of glory that's working? What is that? It's the affliction. Okay. It's the darkness. It's what you're going through. And the enemy is so good to convince us that we're never the only person that's ever had to go through. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Brother John. I just want to make it clear that affliction doesn't mean God puts sickness upon you. That's right. Put the darkness. Because some people use that word sickness yes. uh, as God's testing place or proving place or like, And that is not what God does. Amen. Yeah. The affliction, uh, that in the physical, you're talking about the spiritual. Yes, I'm talking about spiritual but struggle. Most people uh, would think of this as being physical. Yes. It's right. the enemy that brings the physical. Yeah, the enemy's bringing it. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah these, I'm talking about spiritual struggle, spiritual affliction, where you're, where you're going yeah. through hard place. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's a scripture um, that this week when I was in the hospital with Hannah in Proverbs, it says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking on that. Those those times of hardships with me as I go through, I think yeah. I don't want that to be me. I want to be strong when I'm in adversity, and right. I feel like that comes with your maturity and growth as you go through because your attitude, mm -hmm. you know, when you're going through it depends on what your outcome will be. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely right. You see, your growth. What well, she just said is 100 percent right. Your growth, your maturity depend on your actions and reactions in the darkness. Yeah. In those moments where God seems far, in those moments where he seems like he's gone silent, in those moments when you don't seem like you can feel him at all, in those moments, your growth maturity depend on your actions and reactions in the darkness. It is a test. Listen to this. The darkness is a test to see if you are ready for more. 
And I want to prove that to you. The darkness is a test to see if you are ready for more. If, if So if that is true, and I'm going to show it to you spiritually, push. 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 Pursue. Patient. Perseverance. Pursuit. Push. Don't stop. Don't give in. Don't back up. Don't let the enemy get you in condemnation. Revelation chapter 2 verse 17 Revelation chapter 2 verse 17 He that has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to church To him that overcomes I will give to eat of the hidden manna yeah. Yeah. To him that overcomes yeah. I will give to eat of the hidden manna Overcome what? Overcome silence mm -hmm. Overcome the flesh mm -hmm. Overcome our immaturity mm -hmm. If I do those things then I get that hidden manna. What's the hidden manna? Growth, maturity, full age. Those things I listened to you long ago. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. All of those are the hidden treasures of darkness. And I, how did I get those? Because I overcame. Yep. How did I overcome? I asked, I sought, I knocked, I pushed, I pursued. I wouldn't quit. You couldn't make me stop. You couldn't make me stop pursuing my key. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the emotion, regardless of what I feel, pursue him because I know who he is, where he is, and how to find him. So I pursue him. I pursue yeah. his face at all times. Yeah. Yeah. Never stop pursuing. Yeah. Yeah. Even when you don't get your way. Even when you don't get your way. Yeah. You say, how long do I have to do it? Until it's done. Yeah. I can't tell you how long. I can just tell you to do it. Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which you know not of. This actually says call unto me and I will show you great and mighty. That word mighty means secret. Call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great secret things which you do not know of. What does that mean I was doing? I was pursuing in darkness. I refused to give up. I kept calling out on his name. I kept pushing. I kept seeking. I kept chasing. Yeah. I kept knocking. I kept digging. Mm -hmm. Pushing, 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 pushing. Continually and forever in pursuit. You see, in the darkness, the size of your land cannot be seen nor the treasures on it. You just got to believe it's there. Yeah. I'd be standing in the middle of a hundred acre field. And it goes flat and dark, and I can't tell if I'm standing on a five by five patch of ground. Mm -hmm. And the whole hundred acres may belong to me. And there may be vast treasures that are mine inside my land on that hundred acres. But because it's dark, I can't see it. And how am I going to ever figure out what it's there? I endure till the sun comes up. Then I can see what's my land. But I have to endure through the times of darkness. It's all mine. I have to endure and pursue. The hidden face of God is almost always a pathway to a new level. Yeah. The hidden face of God is almost always a pathway to a new level. And that's why I asked you all ago, how many of you ever gone through something that you started you was here, when you came out of it spiritually was here, but the pathway in between was not such a good pathway? Right. What happened? You was going through growth. You were maturing. You were aging. You were experiencing. So the hidden face of God is almost always a new level. How many have ever heard this statement, a new level, a new devil? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. mm -hmm. We hear that quite often. But I want to tell you this. Um, new level, new devil. Well, really what it is is a new test. New level, new devil. Yeah, yes. But what it really means is a new level has a new test. If I'm on a new level, I'm going through a new test. What is the purpose of the test? To harden you, to strengthen you, and to prove your faith? Yeah. To harden you in what you believe. Mm -hmm. To strengthen you in who you are in Christ and to prove your faith. It prepares me for the next level. When I'm going through those times of spiritual struggle and darkness and when I cannot hear his voice, but I won't give up and I won't stop and I pursue and I pursue and I pursue, what am I doing? I'm hardening my faith. I'm strengthening myself in the day of adversity. I am pushing through to the end. I am proving my faith. Think about this. Everybody ever wondered, what did Jesus expect out of it? It's a raging storm. The boat's filling full of water. What did he expect? 
He's down there asleep. What did he want them to do in the first place? They wake him up. It seems intuitive. Hey, there's a water walker in the bottom of the boat. What would you do? We've seen him calm the storms before. How would we get him? What, what would you do? The next thing you'd do is wake up the water walker. Right? right? Yeah. It's a storm the boat's sinking. What did he want him to do? I really think he wanted him to do this. Curl up beside him and take a nap. <clears throat> Don't worry about it. If you're in the bottom of the boat and it's sinking, I'm here with you. I, if you're laying right here, then you know what? Then let the rain waves come on in the boat. Let it go. If that's where you are, I'm going to be where you are. I'm going to do what you're doing. If it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. So move over. Scoot yourself on over. I'm coming in. It's nap time. <laughs> I really believe that was what he expected out of them. That's good. You don't think he expected them to calm the storm? Not at that moment. I think they could have later. Yeah. But at that moment, I think, because he said to them, how is it that you have no faith? What was their word? We're dying here. Mm -hmm. They were panicking in the storm instead of pursuing him through the storm, in the storm, finding faith in him, resting in him. What were they doing? They were panicking. The storm's about to overtake us, don't you see? And I really think what he wanted to do was just come in and do what he was doing. Be still. Right. Exhibit the faith that you see in him doing what he's doing. There's several places in the scripture like that I've asked, what did they expect? Anybody ever wondered, and, and I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself just a tiny, tiny bit here, but I've often wondered, what did he expect out of Hebrew children? They're out there in the desert and they're going hungry. Right. They left Egypt. They've eaten up all their food. They've crossed the Red Sea. Egypt is spoiled. They don't know what to do. There's no food out there where they're at. There's not a Kmart or a Kroger or anything else out there to go purchase from. They're out there with nothing. And all of a sudden, they're all mouthing at Moses, get us something to eat. God's brought us out here to kill us. What did God expect? And I'm going to tell you what I really think he expected. I really think he expected this. A group of people who would stand up and say, if you did what you did in Egypt, bread is easy. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So God, if you kill us, if you brought us out here to kill us, we trust in you. If we starve to death, that's okay. I don't whatever. Whatever you got for us. But I have faith to believe that if you can open up the Red Sea and destroy that army of Egypt and cause us to be on this side on dry ground, then bread must be nothing for you. So I will just stand here and be hungry, but I will not be moved in my hunger. I won't reject you. I won't curse you. I won't tell you it's too hard. I won't tell you I'm tired of hearing my belly growl. I won't tell you that my flesh is in a bind. I'll just stand here and say, if you are that God then, you're still that same God now. And I'll just stand here in faith and say, your will be done. Bring me bread. I believe I have faith. If it's today, tomorrow, the next day, whenever it is, I'm going to stand right here and not be moved. Well, you know, the scripture over Second Peter 1 and 19 says that he'll, he'll shine a light that shines in a dark place that you're talking about there. Until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. See, he did that light. Even when we're in the midst of darkness, he will shine his light there. Even in the midst of that darkness. Yes. yes. Even in the midst of it. He expected them to be mature. He expected them to be mature. To exhibit some maturity. You see, the going through was the process. Yeah. It was the time of maturing. It was the time of growing. It was the time of exercising. What did you just say? I was going to say, but instead of maturing, they murmured. Yes. You said instead of maturing, they murmured. And do you know what God Snake, accused yeah. them of? Murmuring. Yeah. Remember me saying a while ago, how you act and react in your winter yep. is going to determine your maturity and your growth. It, murmuring is the destruction of your winter. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. If I get in that spiritual place, in that spiritual winter, and I find myself murmuring against my God and murmuring against my king, murmuring is absolutely the work of the enemy to destroy you in your spiritual winter. Yeah. yeah. 
You hadn't heard from the voice of God in a while, and so you start saying, well, I'm not going to church this night next Sunday. I didn't hear nothing this week, and all I ever do is just sing anyway, so I'm not going over there. Bunch of nuts up for worship and all that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? You've begun to murmur. Why? Because you haven't felt anything for a while, and so instead of pursuing and pushing, you've begun to murmur because of the lack of bread. Right. Yes. It is the yes. Murmuring is speaking to your doubt instead of speaking your faith. But Chad, if you go over just a few chapters in the book of Mark, when Jesus told the disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side, there's another storm came up. Jesus wasn't in the boat with them, but he came walking on the water. He revealed himself to them in that darkness. In that storm. In that right, storm. Yeah. The darkness. Yes, he did. In the midst of the darkness. In the midst of the darkness. Brother Chad, you think about the murmur. God sent the snakes in there because they murmured. He even had to make the serpent on the pole. That's right. They're murmuring and complaining. The snakes represent the workings of the devil. Yes. And so we open, it says we're not to be ignorant of the devil's devices. And it opens the door for the devil to creep in there. Yes, and that, you know, the scripture also says the man who breaks through a hedge will be bitten by a snake. There you go. How do we break our hedge? We break our hedge through murmuring. Yep. We broke through our hedge of protection through the murmuring and are bit by the serpent on the other side. In those moments of murmuring. What time is it? 25 to 8. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew if I didn't if I didn't find out I'd be in trouble. Yes. Back in the olden days when I was raised, we didn't watch the clock. We did. <laughs> oh, yeah. We went to 9 at 9 30. Everybody was happy, but nowadays they're not. Well, nowadays I've learned that the mind cannot comprehend more than the seat can endure. If I get drunk on the side of my own voice, everybody else pays the price, you know, so. <laughs> Do what? Yeah, or the children's seats. Yeah, the nursery worker will be out here throwing rocks at me in about three minutes if I don't do something pretty quick. Part of the curse of the serpent, he can, he can no longer see spiritual things. And the snake actually smells with its tongue. The only thing he can smell on that cross is the spiritual flesh. Yeah. Yeah, when our flesh gets inflamed. Yeah. You ever, you ever wondered what the birds of carrion are attracted by? Yeah. Yeah. The smell. They're attracted by the stench of dead flesh. And the, the Bible equates demons with buzzards. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Frogs too. What are they going to be attracted to in your life? The stench of your dead flesh. Mm -hmm. That's your murmuring. Mm -hmm. My murmuring breaks through the hedge to release the snake. To attract the carrion birds into my life. When I begin to murmur in my winter. Instead of pursue my king. In my winter, my praise should ramp up. Yes. And some of you will say, but if I come up at the front of the church and lift up my hands and I'm not feeling it, then I am a fraud. No, you're not. You are walking by faith. Push through. Your faith has no feelings anyway. So don't try to praise yeah. your feelings. Praise your faith. Yeah. Now, sometimes I equate the loneliness of God with uh, that we're doing the right thing because if we were were bad, we wouldn't feel no pain at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, you wouldn't know separation. Yeah, so the devil's working on us because we're doing the right thing. That's right. Yeah. 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 Now, yeah. See, it seems to me, in, in my spiritual problems, I have had many seasons where I've gone through that spiritual winter. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that every time that, that when I do come up a level, that the next time that I go through one of those seasons of, of darkness, that it's a darker darkness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh -huh. It seems to me that, that the, the closer that you get, the more growth that you have, the darker the darkness is, is that he hides himself in. Right. But it's because the treasures are so much greater. That's right. Correct. But it's also a place that we, I think for me personally, when I am going through that spirit, that place of spiritual darkness, that I want to see him. Mm -hmm. 
that, and he is that treasure that I'm looking for. But also, I begin to see what I have to lay down. Yes. Because I want to get there, and he says, feel after me. And mm -hmm. we only have to feel after things in the dark. Mm -hmm. That we have to, to reach yeah. and touch and say, is this it? Right. Reach and touch and say, is this it? And the, to me, whenever I found out that the reason that he's hiding, why I can't feel his presence, to <laughs> me, it was, um, it was like putting a wind behind me and pushing me forward to not be discouraged because there is a great prize that's ahead. That's right. It's always for the prize at the end. Remember I said the number one treasure of darkness is your experience of going through it. Father, I thank you for this wonderful people that's come to hear your word today. Father, I pray that what they have heard here will encourage them. And Father, those that are maybe in a spiritual winter, even tonight, that Father, that we have encouraged them to pursue, to seek your face, to continue to chase you with everything that's within them. Cause them to know that you have not left them. Your presence still indwells within them, that they are just pursuing the revelation of your spirit upon them. <laughs> You've never left them, never forsake them, that you'll never turn your back on us, that you're always right there. Cause us to understand that we are in times of instruction and growth. Yes. We are not cast away. Father, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. See you right here Sunday morning for Sunday School, 945.